Georgie, it's great to have you back here after a year and a half or so. I don't even know how long it's been since we had you on the pod, but let's just say that a lot has changed at B-Hub, a lot has changed in the macro environment, but here you are, man, executing away. So thanks for making the time. Come on, Brian. Always a pleasure and a huge honor to be back. Uh, to be honest, I, I didn't feel the felt the time passing the same way. For me, it seems like dog years. So this one and a half years is like seven or even more. But it's always a pleasure to be, you know, uh, exchanging uh, conversations, idea and learning from you. Uh, great to be hey, back. Man. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, yeah. And for full disclosure here, uh, I like to get these things out of the way. We are an investor in B-Hub. Uh, you know, I think the, the first investor, one of the first investors and as a quick story here, which kind of illustrates the, the Latitude flywheel, we actually, you were part of our fellowship. We got to meet you and, and get to know you better. And then we became a customer. We were, I think we were our first customer of B-Hub. And then we're like, you know, we, we really like uh, Georgie. We really like the value prop they have as a company. Let's invest in them. So we became an investor. And then, you know, full circle, you are now one of the key sponsors of the Vamos Latam Summit. Uh, last year, you were a big time sponsor and you're doubling down again. So it's an amazing example of the flywheel and kind of this virtuous cycle of uh, us growing together. So I'm really, I'm really pleased to, to have that partnership with you. Likewise, likewise, Brian, as we, we always say, uh, you and Latitude are practically co-founder of ours. So like you said, you were the first to bet on us in terms of the product. We're our first customers that led uh, uh, you guys to, you know, enhancing the trust even further and batting on us as investors. And it's been a very, you know, uh, uh, important and powerful partnership for us ever since. And, you know, being a sponsor of uh, such an event, come on, it, it was almost, you know, uh, 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 was really not only an amazing investment for us because uh, it's one of the most important events for entrepreneurship in, in Brazil and Latin as a region, but also come on, it makes a lot of sense for, for the partnership, for the products that we have together. So it's super, uh, uh, we are all super boosted and happy to be part of, of the, the partnership with the event as well. Amazing, man. It's going to be a great one. I'm, I'm really excited about uh, this year, September 28th and 29th. It's going to be a big one, more than doubling the size. It's going to be, it's going to be really fun, but let's, let's dive in. Let's, Let's talk a little bit more about your journey. And, you know, you've got a lot of lessons that you've learned over the years. So we'll f reflect on that a little bit. You're a serial entrepreneur here. You've co-founded a few companies. You've sold a few companies. Little known fact is that you were a lawyer at a, a well-known law firm in Brazil. So let's talk a little bit more about what you made, what made you join the startup world and what made you want to work in, in fintech uh, specifically uh, several years now that you've been in the game. So talk, talk a little bit more about those early days and that transition into startups? Yeah. Well, like you said, Brian, I started my career as a lawyer in this big law firm here called, called Pinheiro Neto. Uh, and there I had the opportunity of working with Bruno Balducini, which is the sort of, uh, you know, the the fintech godfather that, that uh, uh, it's what, what, you know, the market has been calling him. And I was pursuing a master's degree and my, my thesis was on the regulation for fintechs because it was just starting up uh, in Brazil. In, in the U.S., we had already amazing uh, cases like uh, Prosper, Lending Club. Uh, the Bitcoin itself was part of this uh, new fintech trend. And Bruno was, you know, the main reference for it. And one of the, the first customers that we had the honor of serving was precisely Davi Veles. And... I was 24 years old back then, and when I met with uh, Davi, uh, it was clear that this guy was changing, you know, the landscape for financial services in Brazil. There was no such a thing as, you know, a digital bank. It was precisely new bank that taught us what is it is a digital bank uh, for for the Brazilian ecosystem. And the same is true for Sergio Furio, uh, that back then he, he was uh, building, you know, uh, Banqui Fácil that eventually became became, you know, uh, creditas. So that was me, you know, as, as a young uh, lawyer, having the, the opportunity of getting to know these entrepreneurs that were, in fact, changing the landscape for, for financial services in our country. And that was very powerful uh, for me to witness that. And it made me, you know, think about it uh, all the time. I, I couldn't sleep. I was thinking, these guys are 
amazing what they, these guys are doing. And there was still a gap in the, the fintech space here in Brazil in terms of uh, this peer-to-peer -peer lending opportunity, which is a part of social finance. So uh, by by having this law background, I, I, I knew what, what could be possible and not possible, what would be a crime, uh, uh, let's say so. And then I think that was, you know, some sort of a, a, a nudge to start uh, this first peer-to-peer -peer lending platform. And that's what I did. I left the firm that it, it was my first experience. It was Biva, right? That's your first, the first company you had and you eventually sold that to PagSeguro, right? Precisely, precisely. Yes, Biva was this banking ideas, ventures and actions. It was this first uh, peer-to-peer lending platform focused at providing loans for, for SMEs. And yeah, after a couple of years, we sold the company to PagSeguro, which is the sort of square for Brazil. Startup to exit, how long was it? Uh, we founded the company in October 2014, and we sold it in July 2017, and the company pursued its IPO uh, in January 2018. So it was a, about four, four years, you know, journey, and it was amazing. It was the first, actually, actually, it was the first fintech to pursue its its IPO in the New York Stock Exchange. Pugs, it's the most listed. What were the, you know, those main lessons and, you know, that you learned from, you know, success, failures in that first endeavor, maybe something you can share with founders in that first journey? Perfect. So I think that the first mistake was uh, I thought to myself that, that I was ready, that I was, you know, that I could be uh, an amazing entrepreneur because I knew the law. And, and then as I started, uh, it immediately uh, got clear that uh, this was nothing. In fact, the, the, having this, you know, understanding of the law had had nothing to do with uh, actually being an entrepreneur, and so that led to the fact that the first team, the the co-founding team, uh, we were all 24, 20, 25 years old, so more or less everyone had the same sort of background, so no uh, complementarity of the team, and on top of that, uh, I, I I was really, you know. Uh, naive. I, I, I didn't know, you know, what it takes to, to build a company, to hire uh, great talent, to, you know, uh, have a proper product mindset. It was a, a lot of learning. And I, I almost uh, went into bank bankruptcy a couple of times, a couple of times, but thanks God we made it through. So some of the key learnings were like to create your team, very complement each other, find people that can fill in gaps that you have and can complement on the journey. Uh, that's one takeaway. And then two, you, you kind of realized that just having the legal understanding was, you know, maybe helpful, but it wasn't what was going to make or break the, the success of the company. And so those were kind of two things. And so you, you must have taken those lessons with you and fast forward not too far in the future after Biva and your second trip to startup land. And it's it's with Zen Finance, right? And that was uh, sure. a business that helped companies to offer credits to their users. Is that right? Precisely. We had partnerships with uh, leading marketplaces in the countries, such as Uber, iFood, uh, Dafiti, Rappi, among others. And we enabled them to offer uh, credit products to their network. So the, this was precisely what we, we, we did. And give us the timeline. So you, you sell the company, you know, you have the last company, 2014, you start. 2000, by the time it's, you know, the, through the IPO, 2018. And when do you start Zen Finance? Yeah, so once we sold the company and, the co and PagSeguro pursued its IPO, I was able to, to sell my stake. And, and then I thought to myself, well, let me take a sabbatical because this was uh, uh, a, a hell of a ride, really hell in the, the sense of the word. And then I said, yeah, I will give myself, you know, a couple of months, you know, for me to, to settle down and, you know, get my, my equilibrium in my life uh, again. But unfortunately, uh, after, you know, two weeks time, I, I thought, come on, I, I, now I, I, I learned what it takes to be an entrepreneur. I, I am much more prepared. I became a paranoid, you know, so I think this is a good characteristic for, for an entrepreneur. So I, I said, come on, I, I'm wasting my time. I need to get back in the game. And, uh, and I thought that this model that I learned 
based on my previous experience. Uh, so I, I, I thought that we could help uh, marketplace and other uh, types of networks to, to really offer better products to their network based on our, on our journey of Biva. And so I, I just canceled the idea of the, this you know, sabbatical um, months or a year and get back to work. You got, you know, you got kind of restless. You saw an opportunity and then you went after it. Talk about the second exit. How was it different in this, you know, the second venture at, at Zen Finance? You sold the company to Rappi. What was different in that transaction than the first one? Perfect. So the first, the first uh, transaction was, you know, uh, a regular path for a startup. So what happens was, was that we were doing okay and we had a series A, uh, that almost happened, and unfortunately, uh, the TS got dropped, and and then we we had to let's say bootstrap. But the company was, you know, uh, killing it. So we were the clear market leaders, and as we sold the company, we provided an 11x return for our investors. So it was a good type of exit. Uh, exit. The second time within, you know, in finance, it was a, a different scenario because. Even though we had all of these partnerships and the product was good, we were in a very uh, challenging environment because it was in the midst of the, the COVID-19 pandemic. So we had, again, a TS sign uh, for a Series A. But because of the, the COVID uh, uh, scenario, uh, basically that there was no uh, VC uh, funding available for, for this you know, time lapse. And again, we... we we got back to, you know, all of the partners said, hey, guys, we had uh, funding for this next three, four months. If you are interested in the product, you may acquire us or invest in us because otherwise this product will no longer be available after this exact day. And then there was some interest from uh, some of these partners and eventually we sold to Rappi. But uh, it was, you know, I, I think uh, a normal exit because in the end of the day, we were just able to pay back our investors and to perform an acquire of the whole team, which was a, a normal exit, but it was not a really uh, great return for the investors. Yeah, I mean, I think that like the, the time period, first of all, you were probably just concentrated on a soft landing for everybody and making sure that, you know, your team uh, was well kind of situated. And um, so uh, it sounds like kind of been through a couple of different scenarios and, you know, here you are on, you know, your third company, We'll get into B-Hub in, in a little bit. Um, I guess one thing I'll say is that the third company, you were able to raise a Series A because you've already raised a Series A. So the, your last two companies, that, that didn't happen. But we'll talk about that growth in a little bit and exactly B-Hub is solving for because I think it's, it's a great product. Probably a lot of listeners could benefit from B-Hub. You, know, you spent some time at Rappi after the sale you know, and you're working on building you know, the banking front. So why did you decide to go back to the drawing board? I mean, here you are a third time. You know, you're a glutton for punishment, man. Uh, you're, 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 you're ready to jump back in the mix and you're, you're building your, your current business, B-Hub. So how did you discover another big opportunity in financial service? It seems like you don't run out of ideas here, Georgie. <laughs> yeah, well, people say it's the third time. The third time is the charm, the charm, right? So I had to experience that myself. So I had to give it a try. But joking aside, uh, Rappi w w was an amazing school for, for myself because uh, it's uh, extremely entrepreneurial at the core. And uh, I had the, an amazing opportunity to, you know, really work in a completely different uh, scenario than, than previously before because it was after the COVID-19. So we basically built uh, this uh, vertical, which is the Rappi Bank, from scratch with uh, this international team and uh, uh, extremely fast. So it was an amazing uh, journey to learn. But then as we were building uh, the Rappi Bank, uh, eventually I came across an article on TechCrunch about a company in the US called Pilot that had just uh, raised uh, a C round uh, from Sequoia and then became uh, a unicorn. And the, the, this company was precisely a tech company that uh, handled uh, bookkeeping services in the US. And in fact, this connected with the last part of my journey uh, at Zen Finance, 
because when we performed the, the exit with Rappi, uh, we had, like we were saying, an acquisition at assets at one hand so that we were capable to pay back the investors and an acquihar of the team at the other hand. And then we took the papers to the accountants, which is sort of required in Brazil in order for them to register that before the board of trade. And then they raised their hand and said, hey, you need to pay the capital gain taxes. And then I said, well, unfortunately, that was not the case. It was no capital gain. I'm just giving, you know, the liquidation preference. I'm just paying that. So we shouldn't be paying capital gain taxes. But then as we dive deeper, you know, we realized that for these, you know, two, two and a half years of the company, all the bookkeeping was not performed in a correct way. So we basically had to redo all our bookkeeping uh, from scratch in this three or four four days. So it was really a nightmare of experience. But that stick it to my mind. And nowadays I'm grateful for that because as we read the article on Pilot, it made an instant click in our mind saying, we live through to this problem. Uh, there, there should be, you know, uh, a lot of other entrepreneurs and companies that are suffering from the way that this type of services, this bookkeeping uh, service or back office service are handled nowadays in Brazil. This should be a big market and a big problem for us to tackle. Yeah, I mean the the reality is that if you're a you know an entrepreneur and you're you've got a you know a business you're running, the finance thing is usually the last thing that most entrepreneurs like to handle. Of course, you know there's exceptions, but you know I think that having had multiple businesses, it's never an area where you you typically want to spend time, right? A lot of times you'll see you know, people hire fractional CFOs or like outsource stuff to an accountant. And, you know, I can speak from my experience in Brazil, like, first of all, the accounting is kind of complicated. The bookkeeping is not that easy. Uh, there's, you know, a lot more challenges than in the U.S. in some ways, which, you know, makes your offering even kind of more attractive. And, you know, I remember like this was a headache. And so, you know, as soon as we saw this in the early days and we, we thought about all the back office you know, stuff we needed, we were like, this is, this is a no brainer. We should, you know, we should hire this. And I think that it, you just make it easy for founders. So going back, this was 2021, uh, the middle of 2021. And then here we are in less than two years, you've raised $30 million uh, in a pre-seed, a seed in a in series A rounds. So the, the fundraising journey, you know, is, is it's been interesting because you caught the kind of the, the high mark. When was the last capital that you raised? What was that was the timing on that? Uh, yes. So like, like we're saying, it, it's been a very fast track journey. You know, I, I eventually I would like to, to come back to, 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 to show that even though it's very fast, I think it's not really crazy because we, we clearly, uh, show that, that, uh, we had product market fit. So you raised that first round and we invested very early, right? We were in the pre, pre seed rounding the first check in. You know, what were the milestones that you were knew internally that you needed to get to in order to kind of think about stage financing? What was the internal dialogue and, you know, what was the target where you're like, okay, now we, we can, you know, go into the next stage of growth? Perfect. So for, for any startup there, there is, you know, in the beginning, I think that the first thing and probably the only uh, goal is to achieve product market fit. And in our case, uh, like we were saying, I, I became a sort of paranoid after these first two companies. So right from the start, we, we said to ourselves, hey, let, let's just try the idea, try the hypothesis. And we came up with this idea of performing a sort of a growth hack campaign through which we invite entrepreneurs for a digital coffee to talk about all these struggles of administering a startup in Brazil. Because Brazil is renowned worldwide to be a very challenging environment for you to do business at. And then to our surprise, we received like, over 500 replies, we performed 314 interviews. And we actually paid a PIX uh, of eight reais in order you know, to pay the digital coffee. We're still in the midst of, of the pandemic. But it was it became instantly, instantly clear that this was a huge problem. And part of this reason for that is like you were saying, you know, it's not only challenging for you to, to deal with all of the, the bureaucracy, all of the the pain points of uh, dealing with back office tax tasks in a country there is very bureaucratic. But on top of that, the way that the accountants or you know these uh, outsource service providers handle their works is pretty much the same way that ever since the the eighties. 
So it's like sending emails saying, hey, you need to send me all these documents in order for me to register that in your in your books. So it was sort of crazy. And then we said, hey, guys, we have an idea for you so that you can outsource to a single guy that you can trust. And then we, we took this, this, you know, 314 guys that we interviewed. And then we started sending their emails and putting them in a wait list. So by the time that I, I joined, you know, the LF3, uh, and I was talking to you, Yuri, you know, uh, tell me, everyone, they said, hey, this idea is interesting. This, this guy is, is he's testing this hypothesis. He has, you know, some wait list. Let's bet on this guy. So by the time that, you know, I had this, this PPT, but the idea was interesting. I had some validation points that the market was huge. Is just 160 billion uh, reais opportunity just Brazil and over $100 billion in Latin America. So the town is, is good. The, it's great. And it's, it's a huge town that, you know, there is some validation or some proof points that this idea may, might work. And we, we were able to, to you know, uh, gather an amazing team. So my co-founder and CFO, he was previously working uh, at Agen handling FPNA, uh, he was the head of FPNA and invest relations for Agent, which is one of the leading fintechs in the world. Marcelo, my my co-founder and CFO and CTO, was working at Billion Constellation Tools for for Amazon. So I think that we were checking all the box that for a, let's say a pre-seed round, it these things w- was you know sort of uh, uh, had you know some of the the, the main uh, things in the checklist for eventually raise a round. And in our opinion, we were already tackling in order to mitigate the risks of, let's say, going for our product market fit. We, we already had a, a great sense or feel that we were moving throughout this track. We, we already had some clear product roadmap for us to tackle. Yeah, it helps to be a second time founder or a third time founder in your case. Uh, that <laughs> provides a lot of confidence as well. Now, one thing I, I want to double click on is these first customers. So you, you do this virtual coffee, you line people, you know, line these people up, you ask, you, you're doing all this, this deep discovery work, which is informing your product roadmap. And then you start, what is your feedback around, obviously accounting is quite complex and there's lots of, you know, I guess bookkeeping is, is quite complex. There's a lot of data points and you've got, you've got a lot of software to build in the beginning. You don't, you know, you don't have all the software built in the beginning. So how do you balance the kind of manual activities in the very beginning uh, versus like building a ton of software to automate pieces of it? Tell me how you thought through that process. Great. So it's precisely like, like you said, Brian, uh, it was a, a discovery process. So in the beginning, we, we had this 314 and actually more because there was some PR for the pre seed round and this uh, wait list got up to the thousands. And then we... What we, we designed was a way for us to test how that we could handle all of the obligations that you need to uh, uh, comply with as a business owner. For instance, you need to pay the taxes uh, on the revenue that you make, on the, the payroll. Uh, so every employee that you have, you have not only to pay, pay the salary, but there are some mandatory taxes, some mandatory uh, pension uh, plans uh, and contributions that you have to, to comply with. So there was a lot of, let's say, tasks that we had to tackle. And in the beginning, we were doing all that manually. It was some sort of flings to me because uh, even though we had the platform, we were, you know, uh, serving the customer. Behind the scenes, we were doing everything manually. Through this procedure, there, there is called Genshi Genbutsu. It's part of the Toyota production system or Gemba. There is, in practical terms, see for yourself. So we were just, you know, handling the work, documenting it. And then eventually what we did was that we took all of these documents and we were then automating step by step of this workflow of tasks. And by doing that, eventually, so it was really small steps at a time. But nowadays we already have over 600 uh, customers that use the product on a daily or let's say weekly basis. We are already processing over 70 million uh, reais a month in accounts payable and more than 20 in accounts receivable. So it's, it's a lot of processing, of data processing, of uh, integrations that, that we handle. But in the beginning, it was, you know, purely 
manual work, but with discipline of documenting the steps, creating a product roadmap for us to uh, tackle a, a problem, a very small problem, a very small uh, task per time. So you're, just to repeat, you're going through the process, you're documenting everything that you're doing, and then at which point do you decide, okay, this is this deserves some software, let's deploy some code to you know automate portions of this. What is the deciding factor where you're like, okay, enough manual stuff, let's, let's automate all of this, and how do you choose what to do first? Yeah, so it's a great question. So what, what we were doing was we were documenting and we were measuring, you know, the time that we had spent for, for each of these tasks. For instance, payroll, for, for us was uh, definitely the biggest pain point in the month because it was the, the biggest uh, number of transactions of payments of data points to be inserted in various uh, 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 platforms like the bank, the, the ERP, et cetera. So it was by far the biggest challenge for us. So it was the first that we tackled. And, but another thing that was in, interesting is that as we were documenting, we were observing the time that we spent for each task but we were also studying, um, let's say, the standardization, right? So once this task, this, let's say, standard procedure got stabilized, it was the time for us then to automate it. So it was this observation, creation of standard procedure, test, validate, then stabilize, and then technology would have this all this documentation prepared for them and making much easier uh, that work to, you know, automate this task. And then it was just a matter of us to tackling the, the biggest time spent for each task in this prioritization. You're creating a lot of clarity for the people that are, are building things because you're, you've got detailed kind of documentation of what needs to happen. I, I want to talk a little bit more about, you know, you, you, so you raise this capital. I know that from the outside, people are like, oh, that's super fast. I mean, obviously, when you compile all of your experience and all the you know, energy you put into building startups, you did raise a fair amount of capital, but it was clear that you had product market fit. So there was a, an easy forecastable kind of growth path. You raised this money. My understanding is that you haven't really spent a good portion of the money. So you retain, not to throw you under the bus here with like, you know, sharing a bunch of data, but I mean, the runway is long. Like, you know, you've got a, a long runway and I think that there's a lot of startups that would be, they would kill to have your runway. How did you decide, you know, how aggressive to be in your investing, what not to invest in, and what in your mind is a healthy cash reserve to have for, you know, a startup at your stage? Perfect. I yeah, I, I think that it's it's the cash is we see as a, an optionality or or a safeguard, you know. But but for us, to be honest, we realized that it was actually last month that we spent through, you know, the pre-seed round. We hadn't uh, scratched the the Series A and the post the, and the the uh, Series A two uh, because we had a we, we raised an extension uh, by the end of last year, so we haven't even scratched this Series A or, or uh, extension uh, until two weeks ago. So as you said, we had a lot of uh, uh, runway, but the the thing is uh, for us, it, it, it was always. A matter of validation, you know. So we we had some clear goals for us to tackle, and then we would spend a little more. And by by being very disciplined, we think that, uh, th let's say, I, I I am fascinated by by the Japanese culture, and and uh, another uh, clear sense that they have they don't have spare. So we we never thought let's hire a lot, let's you know invest a lot in marketing, we are spending less than 10K US dollars a month nowadays. So uh, ever since we started. So it's it's very disciplined approach. And then we, we were really focused at what? Building a product that people like, that are sticky and that solves the problem for our customers. And by doing that, people talk about us. We have, you know, some another extra validation points by the markets, by, you know, uh, customers and that brings us more and more customers. So we were we were thinking from the beginning that we should aim for a sustainable uh, growth, especially because of the the product that that we have. Right, we are like goalkeepers, so we, we're not allowed to commit mistakes. So we we are the last guys in in this the last guard. So 
uh, it was more important for us to do the, the job right than growing uh, a lot, even though we were growing steadily, but uh, it was more important to have sustainability. I want to double click on the comment you made about the Japanese culture. What What is it about the Japanese culture and what practical applications have you taken from that in your kind of disciplined approach to building a business? Perfect. Yeah. So in the case of B-Hub, we are very, uh, let's say, process-driven uh, type of work, right? Because in the end of the day, what we do is that we have a lot of... Uh, very manual, very repetitive tasks on the administrative or the finance uh, stack of each company. It's very painful for you to do that. But and at the same time, it makes no sense uh, for the entrepreneur to invest on that. They should invest in growing their company, in developing their product. It, it's, it's some sort of AWS type of uh, uh, solution. In the end of the day, this is not what makes your, your company or your product or even your beer taste better. It's, it's just uh, a matter for you to have compliance guarantee of, of this thing is, is being uh, handled. And at the same time that you uh, don't have any, any sort of work or effort. So having said that, the Japanese culture is a proxy for us because it, it, it provides this see for yourself, this Genshi Genbutsu uh, that you should, you know, see, observe how things are handled and then you tackle one step at a time. We are crazy about incidents. So we have a, an incident policy here that anytime there is an, uh, an incident like a mistake or that we answer a customer uh, in a bad way or the system goes uh, uh, out of uh, service eventually for, for some, some problem, there are different levels of uh, incidents. And we always report that and we deal with that in a transparent manner that gets recorded and everyone can assess so that this is transparently handled by all the company. These are also part of the, the Toyota uh, mindset. Another thing there's part of uh, the Japanese crew culture is something called motonai. What is that? Is do not spare. So in the Japanese people, they, they are extremely careful with their, their you know, resources because it's an island. They don't have access to oil, anything that's very, very limited. So they, they have, you know, tried to build everything, you know, just in time, which is another cons concept of uh, Toyota. It's because of this, you know, uh, culture of not to spare, not to, you know, uh, uh, do things in, in excess. So all of that were, were elements for us to actually build our culture. We, we call ourselves be samurais because the samurai word in, in Japanese is uh, the one who serves and that serves with excellence. So... Uh, we call ourselves even be samurai, so we're crazy about that. And nowadays, it's something uh, that that other people that we hire said, "Hey, I want to be a be samurai." So it's this is becoming a, a self fulfilling prophecy. Fascinating. One, one quick question for you is: if you think about this culture that you were building, there was a culture of abundance in in 2021, and your company was started in 2021. And a lot of founders have not had experiences in other macroeconomic climates. Would you say that your previous experience informed you and in how you want to operate with a high level of discipline financially? It's tempting to be kind of like following the path of like, oh, just get aggressive, spend lots of money when there is an abundance of capital. Um, was there ever any point where you're like, oh, maybe we should be more aggressive. And here I am preaching this like scarcity mindset during a moment of excess cash. How, how did that, did that ever conflict with like the current macro of the time when you started or was it just a natural thing that you developed as an entrepreneur? To, to be honest, it, it is the first time that, that I get to series A, right? So uh, considering everything that happened previously, I think that, that I am a paranoid optimist. So, so for us, that, that, that was always the, the way to do, because I, I think that uh, we can, we can always, you know, uh, present the data or, or what we're receiving, you know, in a manner that, that is better for us as an entrepreneurs, right? Uh, it, it, it's like, I, I, I am soon, soon I will be a father. So I am expecting my, my first, my first uh, son. So I, I am, I'm going to learn that, but, but I've seen, you know, my, 
my sister. And then it's everything that uh, her baby does. It's amazing. It's unbelievable. I think that entrepreneurs have a tendency to do the same way with their startups because, you know, it's, it's ours. We, we built that. It didn't exist before. So I think that we try to say, oh, we're doing fine. And we spend a little more to acquire customers and say, yeah, uh, we, this, this thing is going to get fixed in the future. So I, I think that uh, this is very dangerous, especially, you know, considering the, the current state of the market. So I think that it's better for us to face the brutal facts, you know, the, the harsh reality. Because then, you know, if the product's not going well, it's fine because then we are able to have these data points and work on that. Otherwise, we're just, you know, uh, uh, receiving conflicting signals and that does not help us to do better. So if the cash, you know, uh, is no longer available, we don't have a product, we don't have a company uh, that can, you know, keep leaving, keep briefing. So I don't know, that, that that's a mindset based on what we live in today. I want to ask a, another question, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way because uh, it's definitely a massive advantage you have having, you know, exited two companies. You know, first one, you had a great return for your investors. Second one was more of a an acqui hire, but then you, you know, joined the school of Rappi, which is an amazing school. Simon, Felipe, and, and Sebastian have built in a, a crazy, incredibly uh, amazing place that has taught a lot of entrepreneurs to go on and build great things. One question I have is that you did sell early in both of your companies, right? Like, so uh, what was that? Was that ever a conversation for with your existing investors of this new company? Like, what's your what's your long term ambition? Are you are you going to hit eleven x and then want to cash in? Was that ever a discussion with the investors? And what is your mindset uh, going into your third company in terms of you're building this for the long term or what the future, what does it look like? Yeah, we, we did have this conversation. And uh, I, I, am, I think that I am a very blessed person, uh, to, to be honest, because I, I, I was able to, to have, you know, some sort of financial safety. It's not that I'm far from being rich, but... I have a home. I I have you know uh, a good uh, sort of financial well being. Having said that, you know uh, the goal for us is is totally to to create an impact, to build something that is really built to last, that causes a significant impact in the in the market. David Vallis, uh you 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 are huge reference for for us and entrepreneurs. Our dream is that one day. We and in our company becomes another uh, good example for for entrepreneurs in our country. That's what you know. It, it's our main purpose to serve as the right arm for the entrepreneur. So I I, I think this this is really a blessing. You know, uh, even if we we have a, an, an exit possibility, that should come through an, an IPO or someone that enables us to continue impacting uh, the ecosystems. Well, the big dream, for instance, that Brazil is renowned as, you know, a terrible place to do business at. We want to make it different because of the technology, because of the product that, that we do. And the good thing is that it is a sustainable business model. We are able to charge. Uh, so uh, it's it's something that if we do it right, it should be a huge company. There is a bad side to that as well, because uh, we, we don't have, you know, uh, Apologies to, to say, because, you know, the market is there. There's a huge pain point. It's a huge TAM. So we need to make it it well, because we, we, we cannot say, oh, the market was not big enough. You know, uh, it was challenged. No, man, we, we have no excuse. We, we need to, you know, just uh, focus and execute and build a great company. What's your philosophy on competitors? Do you think about them ever? Do they, does it ever cross your mind? Uh, Tell me how you how you approach that. It's a great it's a great question. I I do not worry uh, really about competitors. Why? Because to be honest, and and that I think uh, works for for every uh, startup entrepreneur. We're building something new. Otherwise, it, it wouldn't make any sense for you to build a new company for doing something that already exists. In my opinion, there are some guys that are sort of copycats, but I I don't really think about it. Because if you are tackling a big problem, which should be the, the purpose of any startup, 
it's not a problem of competition because it, it, it's like airplanes. You are flying in a huge space. And if you have like, for instance, my market as a proxy, it's a 160 billion market. So I have nowadays, let's say 0.1% of, of their market, let's say so. If there is a competitor for me, they would have pretty much the same. Or even if you have a little more, it, it shouldn't be not even close to 1%. So it's a huge market. We shouldn't worry about competition. What I think that we should worry is changing the status quo. The status quo, the incumbents are really our competitors. And our you know, main challenge is to build a product that is much better than the, the current existing uh, solution available in the market. That, that's the, the challenge. I don't really worry about competition, especially in the startups. I think that a lot of founders get sucked into that and then they get worried and then they take their, most companies, they don't fail because of competitors. They fail because they were unable to execute on their vision. And so I, I tend to totally agree with you. So what's next for you, man? It must feel nice to be in your third go at it. You, you've, you've got some experience under your belt. You've made some mistakes. Talk a little bit more about where you want to take this thing and kind of what are the three things that you're thinking about every morning when you wake up? It's a great question. So like we were saying, you know, the, the market is huge. The pain is also huge. So it's clear that uh, there is an opportunity for us to serve the customers and, and build a great company. So the thing is, what should we tackle first, right? Because we started, let's say, with bookkeeping service. And by dealing with that, we realized that the problem started earlier with the accounts payable and accounts receivables. Then we focused on that and we created a solution for that, which is Behub Prime. And now we're seeing other problems, other adjacent opportunities. There are so many, but we, should, we, we need to be disciplined to tackle uh, what makes sense based on our own capabilities. Because let's say we could do a lot of things Right, but we don't have such capabilities inside. We should tackle the ones that we we're already capable of service of uh, dealing uh, with those issues. So, so for us, uh, I think that uh, one thing is that we're sort of worried with the current state of the market for startups, which represent nowadays about thirty-five to forty percent of the, our customer base. So we're always talking with our customers, trying to see what we can do to help them further because it is a challenging scenario and we need to face the reality. Uh, so we are expanding for other markets like uh, e-commerce uh, sellers, e-commerce and marketplace sellers, uh, uh, consulting firms, marketing uh, uh, agents, and various other type of uh, service providers and companies that sell, sell either service or products online. So, this is something that there is uh, coming to, to our mind. There's a great book co called Crossing the Chasm that talks a little bit of going from early adopters to mass markets. So we're in the midst of that. And another thing for us is really uh, to be disciplined, to keep this mindset as we grow. We're now about 200 people company. And it, it worries me that if we are still, you know, uh, leaving the values that we proposed once we started. Uh, because as we grow, it, it, it becomes trickier because right now, if we grow, let's say, uh, 10 customers, that, that is like less than 1%. And we were growing like 20 or even more than 20% a month. So right now we said, yeah, we need to keep growing, but that's much more customers than before. So it's, it's a different, uh, uh, challenge for us and there, there's a lot of things that used to work once we were a much smaller company and now we need to adjust so i think those, those are the main issues that that come to my mind on a daily basis what's the one thing that you think is non-negotiable from like a culture standpoint as you scale from 50 to 200 great i think really that you know the the values of the company they should shouldn't change you know, th there could be some minor modification, but I think it would be actually a very bad sign that the things that you have created as values, once you start in that, 
is no longer true in terms of values, I think it's a bad signal. You 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 sh you didn't work well in the beginning, right? I, I I think values should stick, and the same is true for for the purpose. But uh, I think that in the end of the day, we need to build a strong culture because difficult times they always come, and if you have a strong culture, you are able to to thrive or to survive these challenges. So for us, uh, what is more important is that this culture is strong so that, that people are connected to the value that we propose. I think this is, is paramount. And in the end of the day, it's three things. We need to have good people that they are you know, competent, they are excellent in what they do. We need to have then people with a partnership mindset that they are connected to the purpose, to the, the values that we created, and they are transparent. If you don't have any of these three elements, I think that uh, these people, this person, they shouldn't be part of the company. Can you give any insight into how to operationalize the culture uh, at, at at scale? Because it's easier to when you're you're smaller and you're like you know everyone's name to ensure that all those kind of values are are intact. But what do you what is something you've learned that has been important for consistent messaging across the organization to kind of permeate these beliefs that you have as an organization? Perfect. So I, I think process are extremely important. So we, we have some routines of uh, meetings and one of them is, is uh, the, the all hands that happens every Friday at 11 a.m. So this is an opportunity for us to leave our value. So for instance, we show the performance of the week of the main KPIs open to the whole company. And we link that with the value that we propose with crystal clear. So being, hey guys, based on the crystal clear value that, that we propose, we're going to analyze the performance that we had in this previous week or, or month. And you can see that we were well, we were good with this KPI, but this one we need to improve. The benchmark for us is that. What, what do you think that caused this issue? So we have the the incidents forum, which is is also based on the on the the crystal clear value that we have. We have entrepreneurs centrism. We have this uh, guild uh, that is focused in the entrepreneur centrism uh, value. So I think that you 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 have to create mechanisms, routines that reinforce those values. You need to reinforce those values on the one ones with your meetings in your performance cycle your performance review, you need to link uh, if the, the let's say, your, your uh, employee is doing well based on these values of the culture and, of course, on the, the performance per se. But it, I, I think it's routines, mechanisms, meetings in which you reinforce the values. And, and the same is true in terms of hiring. So we, we use uh, this platform called called. Uh, greenhouse, which we use for, for hiring. And you have the, the fields there for you to fill in the blanks. They are linked to the values as well. So we, we try to always force the, the, the employees, the be summarized to practice uh, the values. So, but, but, but it's a, an everlasting effort. We're still learning, but I, I am definitely with you because this is the main challenge for us is to to have this, you know, alignment, this uh, ideally perfect communication uh, in a clear uh, prioritization uh, for for everyone in the team. I love the, the, the Be Samurai is a great example of like something that's unique to you that you've built and that you've kind of branded inside the company. And and, and that's uh, that's really cool. Well, Georgie, thank you so much for making the time. Uh, really happy to have you on. Appreciative of the partnership and just like the, the great energy you bring and, uh, you know, everything that you've done also to give back to other founders, you, you know, you're, you're constantly mentoring, giving advice. And it's, uh, it's definitely a testament to you uh, as an entrepreneur that has the right kind of latitude mindset that we, we share uh, of helping and give back to the next generation. So, um, and, you know, it hasn't hurt your business either. So uh, I'm really, really proud to be part of this journey with you and excited to see where you go with it. Likewise, Brian, likewise. Thank you so much, you know, for, for being our partner uh, from the beginning. And for everything they're also doing for the ecosystem, to be honest, I'm just here because I committed so many mistakes and I'm a better entrepreneur nowadays and even a human being. And that's why I have something to add, you know.
<laughs> Thank you so much, man. We'll, we'll talk soon and, and uh, I'll see you in Sao Paulo, Rio or, or somewhere in between. Perfect. Perfect. Looking forward to that. And thank you so much again, Brian. Deeply appreciate it. All right, man. Take care.